Good morning, church. Hey, thank you for adjusting your schedule and being at this one service. And what a great service it is. Thank you for praying for us. The second wave of mission trips, they have started and God is doing great things. Today, I get to welcome our guest speaker who is no stranger to any of us, Pastor Devin Rohr. He's one of the greatest people that I've ever met. One of the most incredible Christians. When it comes to Pastor Devin, there's integrity, wisdom, there is consistency, strength, compassion. I have been so blessed by all of these qualities. I get to watch him every day. I get to watch his passion to see this church be all God has called it to be. I watch him give tirelessly to oversee with great stewardship all the finances and to see the development of all of our campuses, all of our facilities. He truly is one of the best leaders that any church could ever have. I love you, Pastor Devin, and I know that you have a message that we all need to hear. Church family, stand on your feet and join me in welcoming Pastor Devin. All right, y'all sit down, behave yourselves. <laughs> Thank you, Pastor Ron, for those extremely kind words. I'm not sure. Tanya, you think, is any of that true? <laughs> I got my family sitting up here on the front row. They're my heckling group. Even have some drive in all the way from Oklahoma City just to sit here and critique me today. I told uh, Pastor Ron a couple of weeks ago, I said, look, you asked me to preach. And uh, I need you to back off just a notch or two on your messages because if I have to follow you, it's not going to look good. <clears throat> Someone said a while ago, she, they said, oh, I'm so anxious to hear you preach. I said, yeah, I'm anxious to hear me too. <laughs> yeah, this is a, it's a privilege and it is an honor to stand before you today and, and share what the Lord has laid upon my heart. But uh, I'll just be honest with you, this is not my comfort zone. But I'm going to give it my best shot today. Uh, a few weeks ago on Father's Day, Pastor Ron preached a message about the different hats that we wear. And he focused in on the, the warrior hat, if you remember, as far as just the spiritual battles that we do and that we have to fight. And he challenged us that we are to fight on behalf of Christ for our families, for our marriages, for our children, for our culture. And uh, he addressed the external battles that we must fight against. And there were a couple of quotes he placed on the screen. In one of those quotes, I believe it'll pop up there, it says, uh, you live in a world at war. Spiritual attack must be a category you think in or you will misunderstand more than half of what happens to you. And then the, another quote that he shared, and it's one I want to really look at today, it says, if you are going to fight someone stronger than you, you must find someone stronger than them. I want you to repeat that with me today, okay? We're going to give this a shot because throughout the message, we're going to repeat this once in a while. And so let's go. Let's give it a shot today together. Now it says, if you are going to fight someone stronger than you, you must find someone stronger than them. That's pretty good, but we're going to try it again. You ready? If you are going to fight someone stronger than you, you must find someone stronger than them. Pastor Ron addressed those external conflicts that we face, and today I want to address the internal conflict that we face, the war between the flesh and the spirit. In Romans chapter 7, actually Pastor Ron touched on this a few weeks ago as well, the NIV version, Paul refers to the conflict between the flesh and the spirit as the members of my body waging war against the law of my mind and making my, me prisoner of the law of sin. 
In essence, it's a spiritual civil war that we fight each and every day. And simply translated, there is war between the law of the mind, which is my spirit, and what I know is right, and what I know is true, and what I know is good, and what I should do, against the law of sin, which is my flesh, which pulls me and has that conflict internally. Paul gives us an extremely transparent glimpse into his own personal life and his own personal battle with this. You know, and I'm extremely grateful for this little glimpse that Paul gives us. Because on the most, most time, we put Paul on a pretty high pedestal of perfection, of this Christian that is just, wow, you know, who can be like Paul? And, uh, you know, in his writings, he gives us such great instruction and such challenge. And as you think, after you read some of these letters that he wrote to the churches, it's like, you know, can I ever measure up? But here, I can identify with Paul in Romans chapter 7. And I appreciate what the message translation, how this is written out in the message translation, because when you read it in the King James or the NIV or the NASB, it, it really gets kind of like, now what did he say? Because he's go so back and forth and back and forth on this, but the message translation says it this way. It says, I know that all God's commands are spiritual, but I'm not. Isn't this also your experience? Yes. For I'm full of myself after all. I've spent a long time in sin's prison. What I don't understand about myself is what I decide one way, but then I act another, doing things I absolutely despise. So if I can't be trusted to figure out what is best for myself and then do it, it becomes obvious that God's command is necessary. But I need something more. For if I know the law but still can't keep it, and if the power of sin within me keeps sabotaging my best intentions, I obviously need help. I realize that I don't have what it takes. I can will it, but I can't do it. I decide to do good, but I don't really do it. I decide not to do bad, but then I do it anyway. My decisions, such as they are, don't result in actions. Something has gone wrong deep within me and gets the better of me every time. It happens so regularly that it's predictable. The moment I decide to do good, sin is there to trip me up. I truly delight in God's commands, but it's pretty obvious that not all of me joins in that delight. Parts of me covertly rebel, and just when I least expect it, they take charge. I've tried everything and nothing helps. I'm at the end of my rope. Is there no one who can do anything for me? Isn't that the real question? The answer, thank God, is that Jesus Christ can and does. Amen? He acted to set things right in this life of contradictions where I want to serve God with all my heart and mind, but I am pulled by the influence of sin to do something totally different. Paul understood. Are you ready? Paul understood if you are going to fight Someone stronger than you, you must find someone stronger than them. Scripture is very clear, is it not? It's very clear that we fight a war. The battle between good and evil, God and Satan, God's law versus man's law, God's will versus man's will. The warfare within each of us is an internal conflict. We fight it every day. A conflict that can be described as our own individual spiritual civil warfare. The war between the flesh and the spirit. We will choose to obey and honor God and his word, or will we choose our own path and follow another's direction? It's my will versus God's will. The Apostle Paul describes this spiritual civil war numerous times in letters to the churches but in Romans chapter 7, he gives us a glimpse of his own spiritual civil war. Of what I want to do, I just don't do. And what I don't, that's what I end up doing. Paul knew what he should be doing, yet he struggled with doing it. And he knew what he shouldn't be doing, yet that is the very path he often found himself going down. Have you ever been there? Now... Do we know exactly what 
Paul's struggle was? No, we do not. We don't know if Paul's struggle was with lust or greed or drinking or gambling or falsehood or some other form of immorality. We don't know. But we all can identify with what Paul was experiencing and what he was feeling. And what Scripture does show us is that Paul is very frustrated in his own inability to overcome this issue. In Romans chapter 7, we get this little glimpse where Paul just shares with us that I just don't get it right. You know, and so often when we read these epistles that Paul wrote, we do. We put him way up here on a pedestal because that he's challenging these churches. He's giving them instruction through the word of the Holy Spirit. And it's like, man, can I ever measure up to those expectations? Well, without the Holy Spirit and without God's intervention and God's help, we cannot. And that's where today we have to realize that when we get to this place where we identify with Paul, and perhaps today you're sitting here right now and you're thinking to yourself, that's exactly how I feel. This is, I'm just like Paul. I know what I'm supposed to be doing. I know what is right. I know what is good. I know what God's word says. Yet I find myself not doing it. In fact, I find myself doing the very opposite the wrong thing. And Paul was at a place of frustration and disappointment with himself. You can see it in this passage. He realized that the only way to have victory and peace over this issue was to submit himself and surrender to God. That was the only way. And this may be where you're at today, truly. You're at this point of frustration and disappointment. You feel guilty. You feel defeated. I want to encourage you today, do not lose hope because today Christ is your answer. He's your source, your strength, and the solution to help you have the victory that we need to have. Uh, Pastor Ron, in his introduction, mentioned that uh, I'm an incredible Christian. You know, uh, I thought about that when he said that. And I thought, what, what makes an incredible Christian? You know, is an incredible Christian someone that gets up and prays for the first hour of their day? No. Is an cre- incredible Christian someone that has read the Bible through every year? No. Is an incredible Christian some definition that we try to give it by works alone? It's not. You know what an incredible Christian is? An incredible Christian is just like we see Paul right here. An incredible Christian is someone that just won't give up. That when we fail and we fall and we mess up and we don't get it right, we're quick to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit's conviction and we simply say, Lord, can you give me another shot? Can you give me another shot? You know, this spiritual civil war that each of us wage, we must continually, continually surrender to God and overcome the enemy of our souls, Satan. Because, you ready? If you're going to fight someone stronger than you, you must find someone stronger than them. And this is where Paul was. He realized, if I'm going to win, I've got to find someone stronger than me. And so this morning, I want to look at four aspects of surrendering to God. The first aspect is a point of surrender, a point of surrender. Paul had reached a point of surrender in this passage. Paul cried out to God, and he asked for deliverance. He had reached his point of surrender. There are three things that will bring you to a point of surrender. The first thing is a lack of stamina, okay? Paul was tired You can see in this passage, as he shares with us, he's just tired of the struggle. He's tired of failing. He's tired of the guilt. He's tired of the condemnation. And he was was spiritually fatigued and wore down. You know, one of the key components of any army to win in the battle is for the soldiers to be physically and emotionally strong. To be physically and emotionally strong. And if we're not careful... When we lose our stamina, when we lose our physical strength and our emotional strength, 
that's when we become the most vulnerable spiritually because that's when we back off. If we're tired and we're exhausted and we're worn out and we're fatigued, one of the first things I quit on is reading God's Word. One of the first things I quit on is my prayer time. So we got to be cautious about this so that we don't lose our stamina. We don't look, get, become fatigued physically and emotionally, but we remain strong so that we continue to fight the spiritual fight. All too often, we attempt to fight our spiritual battles on our own strength, and that's impossible. Scripture reminds us that it is in our weakness that God is made strong. The second thing that will bring you to a point of surrender is a lack of supplies. A key component for any army to win in the battle is for the soldiers to be well-equipped and well-resourced. Now, we've all been blessed with skills and talents and intelligence. These are our resources. But for some reason, <laughs> we just keep trying to do it all on our own, don't we? However, please realize and understand your resources alone will not win this spiritual battle. Your bank account will not win this spiritual battle. Your degree hanging on the wall will not win the spiritual battle. Your title at the office and your corporation will not win the spiritual battle. In this passage of Scripture, Paul said, but I need something more. For if I know the law that still, but still can't keep it, and if the power of sin within me keeps sabotaging my best intentions, I obviously need help. I realize I don't have what it takes. Man, I mean, once again, I look at Paul's life, and I look at his letters, and I look at his writings, and I look at the, the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that this man had. And when he says something like this, it makes me understand that, man, I don't have what it takes either, Paul. I don't have what it takes. You know, and the reality of this is Paul came to the conclusion that he could no longer depend upon himself alone. He needed other resources to help him. So, if you are going to win the fight, or excuse me, if you are going to fight someone stronger than you, you must find someone stronger than them. The third thing is a lack of strategy. Another key component for any army to win the battle for the soldiers is to be well advised and directed. And Paul could no longer trust his own wisdom to make the right decision. Scripture tells us that we should not attempt, we should not attempt to lead our lives alone spiritually. Hear me. We should not attempt to lead our lives alone spiritually. Proverbs chapter 3, there's verses all throughout the Bible that speak to this. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6 says, Lean not, what's it say? It says, Your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your paths straight. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12, There is a way that seems right to man, but in the end it leads to death. On the other hand, in John chapter 16, Jesus is talking about the promise of the Holy Spirit, and he tells his disciples, the Holy Spirit, he will guide you into all truth. He will guide you into all truth. You know, at the end of the Civil War, when General Lee surrendered to Grant, we see how the Confederate Army had reached the point of surrender. There was a lack of stamina. The men were tired. They were sick. They were worn out. They had lack of supplies. They had little ammunition, weapons, clothing, food, etc. And there was a lack of strategy. Most of the army had been cut off from being able to receive direction from the generals and the leaders of the Confederate Army. And you may be at your point of surrender today, just like Paul was when he said, I've tried everything and nothing helps. I'm at the end of my rope. Aspect number two is there is a place of surrender, a place of surrender. You know, historically, 
or history, I should say, memorializes great places such as battlefields, memorial gardens, cities, and other locations. And as I was watching the, the, the video for the song that we were singing there at the end, it showed the different great places that we look at and we, we have memorialized in the U.S. But let me just name a few of these real quick. Pearl Harbor has a floating memorial over the battleship Arizona. The battleship USS Missouri is remembered as the location Japan surrendered in World War II. Normandy Beach has one of the most awe-inspiring memorial cemeteries as you look upon row after row after row of white crosses in recognition and honor of those who died on D-Day. The United States is marked by many memorials for the Civil War. You have the Gettysburg, you have Bull Run, you have Vicksburg, you have Charleston's, and there's many, many more. Appomattox Courthouse is a historical site for the surrender of General Lee to General Grant to end the Civil War. You know, the Old Testament gives a great testimony of how the nation of Israel was good about remembering the places where God had came through for them. And it's important that we acknowledge these places, that we remember our own personal places. You know, the, the, the children of Israel, they would build an altar or they would build a memorial as a marker to indicate this is the place where God did something special. You know, when they crossed the Jordan River, God t spoke to Joshua and he said, I want you to have leaders from the 12 tribes to go back into the riverbed. And I want you to get 12 large stones bring them back to this side, and build a memorial because I want them to remember how I have fulfilled my promise to you today. Places are important. And spiritually speaking, we need to memorialize these places in our heart, in our soul, in our mind. Don't ever forget them. You should remember the place when you have what, you, what I refer to as God moments. God moments in your life, when you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, can you, can you just close your eyes, spiritually speaking, a little bit, and just, can you remember where it was and where you knelt or where you stood or where you were when you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Can you remember the place where you were baptized? Can you remember the place where you were baptized and filled with the Holy Spirit? Can you remember the place I should say places here that you've rededicated and recommitted yourself to Christ again and again and again when you have surrendered again and again and again. Or perhaps it was the place where you remember when you acknowledged your call to the ministry. There are many special times when God comes through for us and we need to remember those places. I guarantee you this, the Apostle Paul he could take you right back to the exact spot on the Damascus Road where his born-again experience began to take place. You think he forgot that? I believe he remembered well the night he and Silas sang in the prison, and God caused the earthquake to set them free. I, I guarantee you Paul remembered the shipwreck experience, the snake bite. I don't think any of us would forget that one. And other significant times when God came through for Paul in such an evident and powerful way. The places that were embedded and imprinted on his heart and in his mind. It's important that we remember the places we surrender to God. The God moments in our lives. You know, I mentioned I can close my eyes and I can go to the place in the old Verdigris church where I was baptized in the Holy Spirit. It's, it's right down in this area right here, right? I was behind the altar right there when I was filled with the Holy Spirit. It's a pastor's office now. They've remodeled. <laughs> I can remember the place. It was to the right of a communion table. We had a communion table right here, and it was to the right of the communion table, and it was on the steps. I was real close to the communion table. Is I was right up here on the, the steps. They had like three steps before you hit the platform. And that's where I made my altar. And that's where I prayed. And I asked God to heal my foot or I was going to have to have surgery. And when I got up and I walked away, I never had another moment's pain. Yes. 
I remember lying in bed as a young adult having an argumentative prayer. Anybody ever have an argumentative prayer with God? Laying in bed having an argumentative prayer with God about why I did not need to go to Central Bible College. But I finally surrendered to him and I said, okay, I'll go one semester. This front row would not look like it does if I had ignored that call. Today, this area, this building, wherever you're seated, in fact, you need to know this is section A, section B, section C, section D, section E. There's a row number. In case you get confused, you can look it up later. But you may want to remember this place. You may want to remember this place. Because as the Holy Spirit's dealing with you about what I'm sharing today, you may want to remember this place. It's going to be important. Aspect number three is there's a price to surrender. In warfare, the price of surrender is referred to as a terms or an agreement of surrender. When an army surrenders to another army, they do so based upon the terms and conditions set forth by the victorious army or the nation. The same is true in the spiritual sense. We surrender to God on his terms and it is an unconditional surrender. I know we've all tried to bargain with God, but how did that turn out? It never turns out well. Just go ahead and unconditionally surrender and say, not my will, but your will. The price for surrender is simply submitting our will to him. We don't have to shed our blood. We don't have to die. Why? Because Christ already did that for us. We simply have to deny ourself, our will, our desires, our self-centered ambitions, and submit to his will and purposes for our life and to be obedient to his word. I say simple. <laughs> That's not simple at all, is it? There's nothing simple about that. That is why Paul referred to it as a war. It's a war. It's a battle. Paul said, I can't be trusted to figure out what is best for myself and then do it. It becomes obvious that God's command, meaning his word, is necessary. In other words, I have to have a guide to live by. The price we pay is surrendering our will and becoming obedient to his word. In these actions, we honor the ultimate price that was paid for our freedom from sin, which was the sacrifice God or Christ made once and for all. You know, just as I mentioned earlier, as we watched that video, in America, we have specific holidays, Memorial Day, one we just came through, Independence Day, Veterans Day, to honor those who have paid the ultimate sacrifice for our freedoms. Because we all know freedom is not free. Freedom is not free. And the same applies in the spiritual sense. Our spiritual freedoms are not free. Christ paid that ultimate sacrifice once and for all when he died upon the cross for us so that we can have the freedoms. And he is the best example in Scripture that I could find of these three aspects of surrender. Because you see in Scripture where Christ came to his point of surrender. His ministry on earth was complete. The time of the Passover was at hand. He made his triumphant entry to Jerusalem. He had sent Judas away to do what he must do. He had fulfilled the Old Testament prophecies, and he was at his point of surrender. He knew it was time. And he began to share that with the disciples. He began to let, tried to explain to them that it was necessary that I go away, that this is going to be the path that, for me. We also see that he had a place of surrender. 
not just one place, but really two places of surrender. The first was in the Garden of Gethsemane, where he went to pray and took the disciples with him to pray. And as he was praying, he had that conversation with God, and he said, Lord, if this cup could pass from me, I'll come back to that in just a moment. But he also surrendered not only to God in the garden, but he also surrendered to the soldiers. When they come to get him, Peter was all ready to go to battle right there. He was going to, hey, I'll take care of these guys. You, you go that way, and I'll handle these guys. But Jesus said, no, it's time. It's time. The second place of surrender, of course, was on the cross when he surrendered to God. And he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And then we see his price of surrender. There's two aspects of this. When you say, well, he just gave his life. No, there's, there's two, two, two aspects of this. One, you've got to remember, he was also God in human form. His humanity required that he surrender his will to the will of the Father. And that is when he said, if this cup can pass from me. Now, you know, I'm just, uh, I'm not a theologian. But I, I can see Christ, we may not have got all the, the conversation here, so I'm going to kind of, I'm going to pretend that I've got special insight into that prayer. But I'm thinking Jesus may say, now, now, God, are you sure this is the only way this has to happen? I mean, do I really have to go up on that cross and die? Or do you think we could just, you know, I could call down angels right now, Lord. We could, we could turn this whole thing on a dime. We could take over. We could make it all. We could go another direction. I don't know if that's what he said or not, but I guarantee you in his human form, hanging on the cross was not his ideal. But he understood to surrender his will. And that's what he said. It's not my will, but thy will be done. And in his deity, the price was his life. It was his life. A human life was not sufficient. But the Son of God, the form of deity, was sufficient once and for all. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. The price of our surrender is submitting our will to the will of God and living a life of obedience to his word and direction. I want to invite the worship team to come back, if they would, please. And I want to address the final aspect of surrender. The final aspect of surrender is simply there is a peace of surrender. There is a peace of surrender. You know, I can't imagine having, if I had lived back during the era of the Civil War, whether I would have been in that conflict or not been in that conflict, either way, just to have, have experienced all that destruction, all that, man, I, I, you know, you just, it's hard for me to wrap my mind around that when they talk about our nation being at such odds that they would go to warfare and kill each other over it. That brother would fight against brother, that families would fight against families. That, that type of destruction is, is hard for me to comprehend. But I can only imagine the relief when the word began to spread across the nation as small as it was back then that there's finally peace. There's finally peace. There's finally peace. There's nothing that will surpass the peace of your soul when God is in control. There's nothing. Paul was looking for peace from the battle that waged within his mind and in his spirit. And the mind is where the battle takes place. James, in his 
writing goes into great detail about the battle of the mind. No doubt, he too had the same spiritual civil war. And so that lets me understand that no one in this room, no one that hears my voice today, no one is exempt from this. No one. You know, and civil wars cost so much to nations. When you look back over history and you see the different nations, not just in the U.S., but the different nations that have had civil wars, it is extremely costly to that nation. Oftentimes it takes decades, if not centuries, for them to recover. The eternal conflicts we have can cost us dearly. And I'm just telling you this morning, as the Holy Spirit speaks to your heart and tries to draw you into that place of surrender today, please listen. Because a spiritual civil war, I've seen it, it can cost us our families, our homes, our careers, even our lives, and our eternal destiny. Paul knew where he could find that peace. He knew where he could find the victory. Because if you're going to fight someone stronger than you, you must find someone stronger than them. And that was in Jesus Christ. God knew as humans we were going to have this struggle. He understood that we were going to have this spiritual struggle. And in his word, we find scripture after scripture after scripture that provides us with encouragement and solutions to overcoming the enemy of our soul. We just have to humble ourselves and surrender to those instructions and follow his word. The devil, on the other hand, he would like to heap guilt and condemnation on us every time we make a mistake. He wants to isolate us and he wants to convince us that we are the only one. We're the only one. You're the only one in this room today that's having this spiritual battle. You're the only one. That is such a lie. That is such a lie. If I ask for people to stand up right now that's having this battle, uh, well, there'd be a number of us. There would be a number. You know, I love Paul's perspective on this. After he beats himself up in chapter 7 for never getting it right, he says, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's how he ends that chapter. And then in chapter 8, look what he says, the very first verse. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. Stand to your feet with me this morning, please. From this passage of Scripture, we see the reality of the spiritual civil war, the contest between the spirit and the flesh. And we also see the solution, and we are the winner. We are the winner. If you are, say it after me if you can. If you are going to fight someone stronger than you, you must find someone stronger than them. Let's say it again. If you're going to fight someone stronger than you, you must find someone stronger than them. The solution is to surrender and join forces with Jesus. To surrender and join forces with Jesus. Every person in this room and every person that's watching online, you have the opportunity to join forces with Jesus. That is the person that is stronger today. You can't do it on your own. I can't do it on my own. So my challenge to you is this. Will you surrender? Will you surrender? Will you surrender? Man, it is not in our nature to surrender, is it? It is just not. But in this case, and in this instance, it's okay to surrender. It's your best choice. It's the best option you've got is to surrender. Humble yourself and say, Lord, I am wanting to join your team. I'm wanting to join forces with you. Will you examine your heart today? Will you be honest with yourself and with God today?
don't ignore it. Don't ignore it and just say, well, that's just the way I am. (laughs) Will you humble yourself and surrender God again, again, again? I cannot tell you how many times personally I have, Charles, I cannot tell you how many times I have had to fall on my knees or sit at my bed or walk up and down my road and surrender. Surrender. Lord, can you give me just another shot? Can you give me another shot? Pastor Kelly, would you lead us in a chorus today? And as they sing, let's just meditate and think about this. I want you to just steal your heart before the Lord and just examine yourself today. Is there anything that you need to surrender to the Lord today?